James Cameron is one of the greatest directors in all of blockbuster filmmaking. His movies are packed with endearing characters and pulse-pounding action. Well, what if I told you that in the mid-90s, Cameron took those sensibilities and almost made a Spider-Man movie that probably would have starred Leonardo DiCaprio? Well, that's the movie we'll be discussing today, as we break down the development, plot, and cancellation of James Cameron's Spider-Man. The year was 1990, and after years of Spider-Man's movie rights traversing a tangled web of studios, the character found himself at Carol Co. Pictures. By the end of 1991, the studio signed James Cameron to write and direct the movie. As his next project, True Lies, was nearing the end of shooting in 1993, Variety reported that Cameron delivered his completed Spider-Man script to Carol Co. But, in reality, this script wasn't really Cameron's. It was actually the most recent version of the script from before Cameron came onto the project, with his name added as one of the script's writers. By all accounts, it seemed that Cameron was never actually going to use this script or story. Carl Co. wanted proof that the movie could be made within its allotted $50 million budget, so he just submitted the previous script, figuring that he'd deal with any budget issues once he wrote his Spider-Man story. A few months later, Cameron submitted that story as a scriptman, an expanded plot treatment with key points of dialogue. This take on the character portrays a slightly more angsty Spider-Man story full of profanity, sexual themes, and an overall grittier world for Peter Parker to exist in. Years later, Cameron would recall, I wanted to make something that had a kind of gritty reality to it. Superheroes in general always came off as kind of fanciful to me, and I wanted to do something that would have been more in the vein of Terminator and Aliens, that you buy into the reality right away. Though, it is worth noting that he worked on the treatment with the blessing of Stan Lee, Spider-Man's co-creator. I didn't make a move without asking him permission. The much-hyped movie had two persistent casting rumors. Leonardo DiCaprio was heavily rumored to play Peter Parker, and Arnold Schwarzenegger was rumored to be a part of the movie in some form. In 2015, DiCaprio revealed how close he came to playing Spider-Man during an interview with Empire Magazine. Not very close, but there was a screenplay. I know he was semi-serious about doing it at some point, but I don't remember any further talks about it. We had a couple of chats, I think there was a screenplay that I read, but I don't remember. This was 20 years ago. As for Schwarzenegger, he was attached purely by virtue of being Cameron's friend and frequent collaborator. He was at one point rumored to play Dr. Octopus, but even after Doc Ock was no longer set to be the villain, the Schwarzenegger rumors persisted. In reality, the movie didn't even get to the casting stage, though from the way Cameron has discussed and collaborated with those two actors, DiCaprio getting offered the Spider-Man role and Schwarzenegger getting offered to be in the movie very likely would have happened had development progressed. But that never got to happen. A bizarre set of circumstances destroyed the movie before it even got off the ground. But before we get to why that happened, let's take a deep dive into the proposed film's plot. Our story opens with Peter Parker, an isolated, awkward nerd who's being raised by his Aunt May and Uncle Ben. They're great people, but they're about 20 years past their prime to be raising an angsty teenager. One day at school, Peter is picked by Mary Jane Watson, a girl who he's had a crush on all year, to be her partner for their science project. MJ needs an A in the class so she can graduate with a B average, because if she does, her parents promise to buy her a car. Later that day, Peter goes to an honor student seminar at a nearby university. The group tours the lab complex and even gets to see a restricted area where genetic experiments are being performed on fruit flies. And Peter watches a spider that snuck into the fly habitat eat one of the flies. The group leaves as Peter whips out his camera to take some pictures for the school paper, when the spider drops down from above and bites him. By the time Peter gets home, he feels faint and his vision is blurry. He pulls his clothes off and collapses on his bedroom floor. The next morning, he wakes up in just his boxers, about 80 feet up on a high tension tower. This spider bite is making him feel very sick, but before he heads to bed that next night, he does notice some good that came from it. He could now see perfectly without his glasses. 
The next morning, Peter wakes up in his own bed, but he and his sheets are covered in a sticky white substance. He notices that it's coming from his wrists. Horrified, he rushes out of the house, running blindly in a singular direction. He eventually bursts onto the street right in front of a speeding truck. Instinctively, Peter jumps and lands on the side of a building 20 feet off the ground. Peter begins to test his abilities, wall climbing, web slinging, his incredible strength. What was once horror is now exhilaration. At school, Peter tells his biology teacher that he wants his and MJ's project to be about spiders. MJ is grossed out, but Peter needs to learn more about himself. That night, Peter skips doing homework, continues to test his powers, and eventually winds up at MJ's house, where he watches her through her window as she disrobes and gets ready for bed. Uncle Ben loses his job, so in an attempt to make money, Peter begins street performing with his powers, wearing a stocking over his head to keep his identity secret. He eventually upgrades to a red and blue dance skin that he adds a web pattern to. Peter's alter ego, now known as Spider-Man, becomes something of an icon within the community, performing at parties and going on public access variety shows. In an extravagant Manhattan mansion, the powerful and wealthy Carlton Strand watches Spider-Man on a bay of 20 TV screens. He turns to his right-hand man, Boyd, and tells him to find out anything he can on Spidey. Strand was originally a basic criminal, but about 10 years ago while on the run, he found himself inside of an art installation that attracts lightning right when it was struck. After this accident, Strand found himself with the ability to control electrical energy. He can sense it in wires and walls, he can touch phone lines and hear calls, download data by touching a hard drive, anything you can think of with energy, Strand can do and he used this power to take over his gang, changing it from a small-time syndicate to a multi-billion dollar mega player. Using his abilities to steal and manipulate data, he's unstoppable. In school, Peter's grades are slipping in every class, except for biology. MJ at first hates Peter for volunteering them for such a disgusting project, but Peter's personality eventually wins her over, and she starts to warm up to him. As Peter and MJ walk out of school, they're ambushed by MJ's boyfriend, Flash McCreary. He's a jock, a stud, and a snob. Peter can't stand him. He ridicules and threatens Peter, and as he turns to leave, he sees Flash slap MJ in the face. That night, Spidey delivers some karmic justice when he ambushes Flash outside of gymnastic practice. He beats him semi-conscious, destroys his car, and tells him to stay away from MJ. Later that night, Uncle Ben enters Peter's room and tells him that despite being a little past the age to be able to help him navigate growing up, that he is there for him. Peter tells Ben that he's okay, and Ben leaves, knowing that he failed. Spidey continues to spy on MJ and comes to find out that she has a home life full of abuse and toxicity. After one of his late night appearances, Spidey is approached by Strand's associate and lover, Cordelia, who offers him a card which reads, There are others like you, with an address and a time for a rendezvous. Spidey tries to follow her out when he's attacked by Boyd. He tries to fight back, but with every punch he throws, his fist sinks into Boyd's body and is covered in sand. Meanwhile, Boyd is throwing punches that hit like he's made of concrete. And that's because he kind of is. Boyd has the power to soften his body into sand or harden it into rock at will. Eventually, this Sandman sifts himself through a grate in the ground and escapes. Television shows won't pay Spider-Man for his appearances since he won't reveal his identity. So he has a sleazy booking agent cash the checks for him. One day, Peter has Uncle Ben drive him to the agent's building under some pretense so he can collect his money. Spidey enters the agent's office only to find that this sleazeball is out of business and broke. The agent tells Spider-Man to beat it, and not willing to reveal his identity to get the money himself, he has no choice and leaves. As he does, he notices a robbery in progress, and that the thief has a tattoo of a cobra on his hand. The criminal flees and the security guard chastises Spidey for doing nothing to stop him. But to Peter, it wasn't Spider-Man's job. As Peter leaves the building, he finds a small crowd of people gathered around Uncle Ben. 
who was waiting to pick Peter up, lying on the ground, shot by a carjacker. Spider-Man tracks down the killer to a warehouse only to find the thug with the cobra tattoo. The killer shoots at Spidey as he weaves through the bullets and webs the guy up. He delivers the killer to the police and the cops tell Spider-Man to pull his mask off, but he refuses, gets physical with the cops, and flees. That night, a local TV station owned by J. Jonah Jameson runs a story about the two cops that were assaulted by the mysterious figure known as Spider-Man. From here, Spidey goes after criminals with reckless abandon, becoming a one-man war on crime. He tears through criminals single-mindedly and viciously. During this campaign, he comes across two cops beating somebody up and swiftly webs the cops up, which makes Spidey now a wanted criminal. He can't make any more public appearances since he's a criminal, the cops hate him, and every time he stops a criminal, the cops hate him even more for making them look ineffective. Jameson is spinning a narrative of fear around Spidey, and on top of that, he has to deal with the actual bad guys. But in some communities, Spider-Man is a local legend. While working on the biology project, Peter finds out that MJ is actually a big Spider-Man fan because she knows what it's like to have to wear a mask. Spidey begins to follow her one day when thugs attack her. He intervenes, defeats the attackers, and whisks MJ away. They wind up sharing a tender smooch over the top of Spidey's mask. Spider-Man heads to the rendezvous point and is met by Cordelia and Strand. Strand explains that he's looking for exceptional people who were also touched by fate. Boyd, for example, was a maintenance man at a big military research project and got caught in an experiment's explosion that merged his molecules with sand. So Strand took him in and showed him his way. He also apologizes on Boyd's behalf for the fight earlier. Strand just wanted to see if Spidey would fight back against somebody as strong as he was. Strand, similarly, wants to take Spidey under his wing and tells the webhead that extraordinary people deserve whatever they can take. Spidey, who first saw Strand as somebody who understands what he's going through, quickly gets a bad vibe and declares them enemies. Boyd and Strand attack in retaliation, but Spider-Man escapes. So Strand begins a Spider-Man smear campaign. He gives Jameson unlimited budget to bash the wall crawler. Stories are printed in magazines and newspapers owned by Strand, and to top it all off, he gets thugs to dress as Spider-Man and commit crimes. Strand wants Spidey to hate humankind and be driven back to him. And it starts to get to Spider-Man, eventually stealing a bag of $20,000 from drug dealers that he stopped, justifying it in his mind that Aunt May needs an operation and that she can't pay for the house just on social security. He figured that being your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man would be easier as he went along. But at this point, he's still waiting. Peter ultimately decides to do the right thing and opens the bag of money, dumping it all on the people of New York as he swings. But it's one of the hardest choices he's ever had to make. Later, Spider-Man meets up with MJ and takes her to the top of the Brooklyn Bridge. As they stand atop, Spidey talks about spider mating rituals. He tells MJ to close her eyes and we get to watch these high school seniors... kiss? on top of the bridge, with MJ's eyes closed the entire time. The next day, MJ seems happier, like all of her problems are solved, as she lets one of her project spiders crawl up her arm. Boyd, who had been following MJ for the previous two days, kidnaps her that night. Spidey tracks them down to Strand's mansion, but when he gets there, it's empty. But the bay of TV monitors are all paused. He presses play on the VCR, and a video begins to play of Strand, with MJ as captive, telling Spidey to meet him on top of the World Trade Center. Spidey rips his way through the city until he crashes through the glass on the observation deck. Strand again tries to convince Spider-Man to join him, attempting to bribe him with $250 million in cash that he's stolen. But Spidey learned his lesson from the last time that he stole money. He was wrong in doing that and that's a line that he will never cross again. Spidey and MJ flee to the roof of the tower, before quickly getting MJ to a stairwell to escape. Just then, Strand and Boyd show up, and Spider-Man begins to fight these two, Electro and Sandman, 
two on one in a climactic final battle atop the building. He eventually lassos Boyd and pulls him into one of Strand's blasts, turning him into molten glass. Spidey then pulls Strand over the side of the building with his web. They freefall as Spidey webs the other tower. They swing over and Spidey bangs into the side of the building, but Strand keeps falling and careens into the side of the wall with a sickening smack. Spider-Man pulls Strand's broken body to the top of the tower, and Strand has to know. He asks, who is Spider-Man? Peter removes his mask and tells him his name, and Strand, in his dying breath, remarks that it's unbelievable that he was defeated by a high school senior. Peter takes all $250 million and sends it showering all over the streets of New York. Peter and MJ wind up getting an a on their biology project, but MJ doesn't care about the car anymore. In fact, she's going to go to a different school, get her grades up, and then try to get into medical school. She thanks Peter with a kiss, and realizes that it feels familiar. At this point, Peter reveals that he's Spider-Man, to MJ's delight and total surprise. Flash shows up and asks Peter to come with him. They walk around a corner, and Flash tries to pound Peter, but he dodges every single punch, humiliating him in front of everybody. MJ and Peter get accepted to different schools, but they see each other every weekend. Her grades are even better than his, but Peter blames it on the heavy hours as he swings off into the night to protect the city as the amazing Spider-Man. I'm very mixed on this treatment. Peter has a few too many moments of being overly violent or just flat out creepy for me to fully root for him. And Electro offering Spider-Man to join him and Sandman just because they all have superpowers feels like a very been there done that trope. And the one that confuses me most, MJ's inner character conflict is seemingly solved by hooking up with Spider-Man, and it seems like an immediate switch flip of her having some sort of conflict to immediately everything being fine, which, at least in my opinion, is a totally bizarre choice. But at the same time, there are individual moments here that I adore, especially Spider-Man returning the money to the people of New York. And this was James Cameron, so the action likely would have been spectacular. But overall, I'd say that this take on the character isn't for me. But who knows, maybe if Cameron ever got to the point where he was able to complete a script, maybe I'd gel with his vision a bit more. But with this scriptment in place, the project began to make progress. So that raises the question, why did it get canned? There was no one factor that took down Spider-Man. Rather, it was a perfect storm of very specific issues that all came to a head at the least optimal time. When Carol Co. hired James Cameron for the film, they used an exact copy of his contract from Terminator 2. And one of the terms within that contract was that Cameron had final approval on credits for the movie. When Calco acquired the production and distribution rights for Spider-Man, they did so from a man named Menahem Golan, who had been trying to get Spider-Man off the ground since the mid-80s at a slew of different studios. Golan's only stipulation in the deal with Calco was that he be recognized for identifying the potential in Spider-Man early on and trying to shepherd it for years in the form of a producer credit on the finished movie, which Calco agreed to. But Cameron didn't, and he didn't want to give him that credit. And as early promotional material for Spider-Man began to roll out, only Cameron's name had been mentioned as a producer. Golan claims that over the course of the next few months, Carolco tried to pressure him into giving up his producer credit, allegedly even withholding their payment to his company, 21st Century Films, for the Spider-Man rights. This all culminated in Golan filing a lawsuit to dissolve his contract with Carolco in April of 1993. And then over the course of the next year and change, a barrage of lawsuits would come, with Spider-Man's tangled web of film rights finally catching up. Carol Coe sued Viacom and Columbia TriStar, who years prior, Golan had sold the movie's TV and home video rights to, respectively. Carol Coe was suing in an attempt to regain those rights for themselves. 
Spycom and Tristar, then Countersued, Carol Co, 21st Century Films, and Marvel. And then MGM, which was owned by a company which also owned another company that used to have the Spider-Man rights, saw themselves as the true and honest inheritor of the Spider-Man rights held by that other company. They sued Golan, 21st Century, Viacom, Tristar, Marvel, and others for fraud in their original deal with Marvel. Meanwhile, through all of this, 20th Century Fox was contesting Cameron even doing the movie, claiming that he was under contract to work with them exclusively. And then within the next year, Carol Co, 21st Century Film, and Marvel all filed for bankruptcy. After all of this confusion, all of the Spider-Man rights reverted back to Marvel. At this point, Cameron tried and failed to convince 20th Century Fox to buy the rights, which were swiftly snatched up by Sony. Between him already being preoccupied with Titanic and his frustrations with the seemingly endless delays and problems in getting Spider-Man off the ground, Cameron decided to leave the project. And with that, James Cameron's Spider-Man was officially canceled. While I think that the movie would have been interesting as a James Cameron action flick, I believe that this darker, more violent take on the character would have been a very shaky launching point to start a Spider-Man franchise. Comparing this to what we ultimately got with 2002's Spider-Man, I gladly take the camp and melodrama of that movie over the grit and cynicism of this treatment any day. In the end, I believe that it was for the best that this movie never got made. But that's the story of James Cameron's Spider-Man, and the end of yet another episode of Canned Goods. So until next time, thank you so much for watching, be good to each other, and stay hemmed.